Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the GM Ecotec engine and how it works. Now this variant of the engine is the LV7, which is a port injected, naturally aspirated 1.4 cylinder, 4 cylinder engine. This is out of a 2020 Chevy Spark. This engine is practically brand new, it only had 2,000 kilometers on it before it was hit and totaled. Taking a quick look around this engine, you can see we've got dual overhead camshafts here with variable valve timing on both. Underneath this timing chain cover and over here we have the port injected fuel rail and a plastic intake plenum and an itsy bitsy little throttle body so cute coming around the back here you can see we've got aluminum block aluminum head and the valve cover we've got a vacuum pump over here to power things like the brake booster we've got our four coils at the top here for really easy spark plug changes and integrated exhaust manifold over here all right so let's take this thing apart and see what's inside of a brand new engine the first side we're removing the throttle body pop that off it's so small and cute isn't it now i'm going to remove the intake now I can remove the intake assembly. Here you can see in the intake assembly, the whole thing is made of plastic. You've got our gasket integrated inside of there. And here you can see where the port injectors are that inject fuel just before it goes down into the valves. Of course, this engine is brand new. So as you'd expect, there's zero carbon buildup behind the valves. All right, let's remove all the ignition coils next. These are all brand new. None of these plastics are really brittle or anything. Now I'm going to unbolt the valve cover. Just remove this accessory here, you can see the oil control valve is brand new. Well of course, I was missing the bolts inside of the valley. Now I should be able to pop off that valve cover. So here's one stupid design. The valve cover actually loops under the camshaft over here. That's why I can't get it off on this side. So I'm going to remove the vacuum pump to see what's going on. Well there's a vacuum pump. Cool, it looks like we've got a little vacuum switch over here. And because the camshaft drives that vacuum pump, you can see here is the cam seal where that vacuum pump plugs into. And now I can remove the valve cover. Taking a look under the valve cover here, you can see things are absolutely clean. There's no varnish or anything like that. Even the seal here is very pliable. Now what's interesting here is the PCV system which is underneath this baffle. You can see here we have two PCV ports, one over here and one at the back here. But what's cool about it is that it uses some kind of a security screw over here. It's not really a Torx, it's just like one of those one-way screws so you can't really get it out. Same with this one over here, it's just a security screw. I don't really know what the point is behind that because in my opinion a PCV valve is actually a maintenance item rather than changing the entire valve cover. Especially because this is not plastic so you'd expect it to be reusable. Now taking a look under the valve cover as you'd expect things are practically brand new clean there's no oil deposits or anything like that this is how engines should look when they come out of the factory it's a far cry from all the other engines I've taken apart with hundreds and thousands of miles looking at the design here you can see we've got the exhaust camshaft and intake camshaft on this side we've got our little roller wheels here for our cam position sensors and then here we've got the camshaft lobe that acts on this roller arm over here which in turn then pushes down on the valve spring as opposed to have a cam on bucket design which is a little bit more simpler the benefit to this is that you've got oil galleys inside of here that's going to push up on this hydraulic lifter and that means you're always going to have good contact between the cam lobe and this roller rocker arm and you don't have to do valve adjustments. Now up at the front here you can see we've got our variable valve timing system. We had our oil control valve solenoids that's going to plug into the valve cover up at the top here and that's going to redirect flow to these cam phasers at the front here which in turn are going to phase the cam shafts relative to the crankshaft in order to vary timing to give you more power and economy. Now whatever metal they're using for the valve cover, it is pretty brittle, so when you're prying on it, you can easily break off these tabs. Next up, we're gonna to move to the front end here and remove some of these components in front of the timing cover. This here is the engine mount bracket. Whoa, this is super light. It's gotta be magnesium. I remove this compressor next. Let's remove the water pump next. No coolant. So here's what the water pump looks like. This impeller is unfortunately made of plastic. All right, next up we're going to remove the thermostat housing on the back of the water pump over here. Here's the thermostat and the housing is made of metal, which I like. We're going to remove these two tents here that go to a crossover tube to the other side of the engine. And now I'm going to remove the water pump housing. Use a 13 millimeter. Pop that off. Coming around to the back of the head here, you can see that crossover tube flows to this plastic manifold. This is going to take the radiator hose as well as the two hoses that go to the heater core inside the cabin. There you go. This one's made of plastic. After hundreds of teardowns, I've now learned my lesson to lock the crank bolt loose while the flywheel is still on there and before it goes on the engine stand. All right, next up, I got a lot of 10 millimeter bolts and nuts that go around the timing cover that we're going to remove. There's the timing cover. 
that's practically brand new. Taking a look at the timing setup on this GM Equitech, things are really beautiful. I like how this is laid out, very simple. You got your crankshaft going directly to your camshaft and two timing slides. Now these slides are made of plastic, which I don't like. And you have a simple hydraulic tensioner over here. There's no complicated chain setups over here. There's no extra idlers, there's no water pump or anything. Very simple. Knock these bolts loose here. You will start taking the timing system apart here. These are 13s for the tensioner. Here. The chain tensioner looks like when it's basically brand new. This one's got an extra slide on it here, and this one doesn't. I'm gonna remove these tens here. Now I can remove the timing chain. This is a double roll timing chain. Next up, I'm gonna remove all these cam caps. These are eight millimeter bolts. Okay, I have questions. Only 2,000 kilometers, and we've already got this much wear on these cam cap bearings. Or even if they're machine marks, it's pretty bad. I don't like that. The camshaft itself also has these little grooves on it, which indicates some kind of wear. So maybe they're just using a thin oil that's accelerating the wear on these camshafts. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and remove this exhaust camshaft and the intake camshaft and throw them in the garbage. So here's what one of those little roller looks like. You can see it has a little roller on it and then a little socket on this side that's going to hook up to your hydraulic lifter and this side over here is what's going to touch the top of the valve and compress the spring. Seems like these are another one of those warranty prone engines that have these little hooks on them to make it easy for you to take out the engine when it fails. Check out how clean that engine oil coming off of this is. Pretty much brand new. Head bolts on these are a 10 millimeter hex. Alright, I'm going to zip these off. Alright, and now I should be able to remove this. What the heck? Here you can see we've got a multi-layer steel gasket and it's bright red. Now most multi-layer steel gaskets I see have like two layers or a maximum of three. This one actually has four layers. That way it's got quite a bit of thickness to it. I wonder if this just stems from a history of GM blowing head gaskets. Well I have to say I'm quite disappointed in the combustion chamber. There's quite a lot of carbon deposits built up on top of this piston head here. I thought it would be practically clean just having only 2,000 kilometers on it. But it does have a lot of carbon. That's, that's kind of amazing. I wonder if they just use cheap gas or that's just the design of this engine's combustion cycle. Now it's time to turn the engine upside and down so we can work on the bottom end. Now it is winter so I found my brother just left his sweater hanging up there and when I grabbed it I'm gonna put it down here so we can sap up any oil. I'm a little disappointed every time I got a shirt ready I don't get that much mess. The oil pan on the Chevy Spark is so small and cute. Just a stamped steel unit. I'm gonna go ahead and take off all these 10 millimeter bolts. That's what the inside of the oil looks like. They use a lot of RTV here from the factory. I thought they would use an actual gasket. So you've got a little oil solenoid inside of here. I don't really like electronics inside of the oil pan. They should make that external. Next up we're going to move this upper oil pan. You can see we have our original AC Delco filter on here. And see how hard this is to fly out. Tell these guys use too much RTV. This is the channel here that's made of RTV. You can see it's got these baffles to help flow the oil down to the oil pickup tube. Now taking a look underneath that oil pan, you can see we've got an oil pickup tube which is integrated into the oil pump assembly. We have the solenoid over here that's going to control the amount of oil pressure and oil flow. Either that's going to direct flow back into the oil sump if it's not needed or take that flow back up to the head like say if you're engaging variable valve timing or something. Here you can see the oil pump is going to take oil and send it down through the block over here. We've got an oil filter over here and the oil pump chain drive at the front here. Over here you can see we've got a plastic oil baffle. Once again that's just to collect more of that oil dripping down from the top and bring it down to the bottom here. Knock off this bolt for the oil pump and then knock off the bolt here for the spring tension oil pump drive. It's just a little spring that holds this one on. I can take off the oil pump drive here and the chain. Next I'm going to remove the oil pump from the block assembly here. You can see that oil pump. Get that oil filter off. See the oil is almost like honey. It's really, really clean. Next up, we've got this plastic baffle here. Bunch of 10 millimeters. 
Now the main cap bearings here are integrated into this ladder frame assembly. It's all one piece, which I like because it will make the engine's bottom end a lot stronger than just using two bolts on an arc over here. So we're going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that go around it, as well as these two main cap bolts for each bearing. Main cap bolts are only a 13 millimeter. Oh my god, I just snapped my toothbrush. I'm going to zip this off. Now we're going to remove the 10 millimeter bolts that go all the way around. I hate how the gaskets are so hard to remove on this engine. Flying action here. Alright, now I can remove this ladder frame. And I can pop off the rear main seal here. This is what's left of my brother's toothbrush after removing that ladder frame. I'm sure he's not going to be very happy, but he probably doesn't need to brush his teeth anyways. Taking a look under the ladder frame here, you can see you've got the five main bearings. They are absolutely clean. Of course, the oil itself is like honey. That's also very clean, as you'd expect in a brand new engine. Things are in pretty good condition here. I'm going to remove now the connecting rod cap bolts. These are a 10 millimeter. Let's remove these connecting rod caps. The bearings are brand new. This bearing here, again, brand new. Now we can also remove the crankshaft. You could probably make like a nice little table out of this. You don't even need to scrub any carbon off of it. Now I'm going to remove these pistons. So here's what the pistons look like. You can see they're full of carbon on the top there, which I mentioned before. But what I see here is that there's a slight bit of wear here on the sides. And that's just due to piston slap on cold starts. I'm surprised it actually shows up right now at around 2,000 miles. So there's nothing to be sneezed at when you take apart your 200,000 miles and you see even a little bit more wear here. Of course the oil rings and the compression rings are brand new. And they move nice and freely and there's no evidence of any carbon buildup. So here we've got all the components laid out here. Let's take a closer look at how this engine works. And we'll start here at the upper oil pan. Where you can see it's just a giant baffle that brings all the oil in and it will pass through a wire that controls the oil pump. Now speaking of the oil pump, you can see this one here has a variable drive unit where the computer can control the amount of flow. We've got a nice clean pickup tube. Obviously it's a brand new car. And we've got the drive here that comes from the oil pump chain. And the feed here goes out to the engine block through these ports. I'm gonna pop this little sucker off here should be able to remove this little solenoid. See, it's just an oil control solenoid. I'm going to see if I can remove some of these torques so we can see what's inside. I'll just pop this open here. Oh, and you can see it's a vein type of oil pump. You can see the little veins in here. As it rotates, these veins here will move outward because of centripetal motion. Now, taking a look inside the oil pump, those veins are going to turn in here, and you can see the inlet and the outlet over here, where the oil pump is just going to provide fluid flow, and that's going to push that flow out to these outlets over here. Now, this entire thing is going to pivot along this little pivot axis, and it has this spring here that moves back and forth, and that's going to adjust the rate of flow. Or you can kind of see as I compress the spring, this entire thing wants to rotate to compress the spring. Let's see if we can remove this guy here. There goes the spring. Now you can see the oil pump housing where those veins rotate inside. Now here's how this variable pump works. You can see in this position here, the oil pickup tube is going to bring oil to the inlet side over here. And because you have a smaller side on this side and a larger side on this side, this oil pump is going to rotate and it's going to squeeze the fluid, providing a lot more flow to the outlet over here. However, when you move this collar towards the backward position over here, you can see that the room around the veins here are more even, which means that you're not going to have as much fluid flow because it's not really squeezing the fluid as it exits over in this part. It's just providing a little bit of flow. All of that is controlled through this oil control valve that's sat here. The oil control valve is going to take that inlet pressure and essentially short circuit it out to the other side and that's going to cause this thing to move back. Once you release that oil pressure, it's going to just push it back over here and create more oil flow. And that's how you computer control the amount of oil flow that you need. Of course, you need to generate a little bit more oil pressure for things like variable valve timing. But maybe when you're down at idle, all you need is just the minimum pressure. Now, this oil pump mounts to this ladder frame block over here, which forms part of the main bearings for the crankshaft. You can see the exit oil over here is then going to come out through this port over here, which is then going to make its way over to the oil filter, which screws in over here. Now, at the side here, you can see the galley that brings the oil to the oil filter. And once it's filtered out, it goes straight through up 
up into the block over here. Now one thing I do like about this design is that they have a nice chunk of aluminum here as opposed to individual bearings that hold the crankshaft on. That means that it's not just a two bolt design. As a matter of fact, all of these bolts around here commit to the sturdiness of the bottom end of this engine, which will make it strong and probably reliable. This engine was still on its original AC Delco filter. Looking at the crankshaft, this thing is pretty much brand new and really good condition. The one thing I wanted to mention is look at how they hollowed out all of these sections in here to give you a lot more weight savings. I'm kind of astonished that they were able to hollow that out. Most other crankshafts are completely forged without any of these holes inside. That pretty much makes it really lightweight, but I wonder if one of these could crack if you like turbocharge it or something. At least for what it's worth, it'll handle the 90 horsepower or whatever this engine makes. And one thing I don't like about that ladder frame design and the upper oil pan is that they're using this liquid gasket in the channel. It makes it a little harder to work on when you have to reseal things. I'd rather they actually use a proper gasket that you could fit on here dry. Now as far as the condition on the bottom end here, things are pretty much brand new. There's no wear or anything that you found in the upper end. You've got these bearings here that have no lines in them or anything like that. Now as far as the lubrication system on the block, we've got that ladder frame which is going to bring in oil down this way. You can see there's a hole drilled for it that goes into the block this way. And then we've got the main oil galley that runs along the whole length of the block here to which these little oil sprayers tap off to and they can lubricate the inside of the cylinders as it's moving up and down. The main bearings here are also drilled to tap into that main oil galley over here so they can also be lubricated and lubricate the connecting rods. So the way the lubrication system on this engine works is a little interesting. So we had the main oil galley located over here that runs the length of the block. It taps off over here for the chain sprayer that runs along here. It then gets sent up to this main bearing and then back down into this chamber here where the hydraulic tensioner lives. Further from that, you've got another galley that will go up to the head on the left side. Now just like any typical economy car engine, you've got the open deck design here where the cooling jacket runs all the way around the pistons here. There is no gap between pistons though because GM tried to make this engine very compact for these smaller applications. And now we come to the cylinder head and just like the piston tops we saw earlier, this is in pretty rough shape for being a brand new engine at least. Even the spark plugs themselves have a lot of black suit on them. I wonder what's up with the tuning on these engines. Looking over here you can see the holes that are going to feed the variable valve timing system. If you follow that up you can see the galleys here that are going to go straight up to the camshaft at the top. Corresponding those of the block we've got the right side and left side ports. This one here has two holes. One that will go to the main oil galley to power the rockers along this side and the other one that's going to go all the way up here to power the variable valve timing system. Over here on the left side we've got another port here which is going to bring oil up to this hole here to power the variable valve timing system on the intake side. Now over on the intake side not only is this variable valve timing system going to power the variable valve timing gear but it's also going to send oil through the camshaft here and you can see all of these holes here which are going to help to lubricate the bearing surfaces against the head and the cam caps. Now further at the back of the head here we've got another hole which is going to send some of that oil pressure down to this oil galley over here along the length of the head and that's what's going to power these hydro hydraulic lifters. Now when hydraulic pressure is applied to these little lifters they're going to push up against these little roller arms here and that's going to prevent the valve train from clattering especially as it starts to wear out and that's pretty important on a crappy economy car engine just like this because you don't want to be doing valve adjustments on such a cheap crappy car. On the exhaust side things are a little different. You can see the main galley that runs along the head here that's going to power those hydraulic lifters. They've also got these little holes in them that's going to bring oil from that galley over here to lubricate this camshaft. The oil is not actually traveling through the camshaft itself like in the other side. Here's your variable valve timing actuator. I do have another video on how this works. If you want to find out, click the link above. And as I mentioned before, you can see there's a lot of wear on these camshafts for being from a brand new engine. You can see SGE stands for GM Small Gasoline Engines. And you see all the cam lobes here say LV7 on it, which is the name of this engine. Now the oil galley in the exhaust side actually runs straight into the vacuum pump. And you can see here on the back of the vacuum pump where that oil galley is going to lead into. And this is where the camshaft is going to hook up to drive it. So let's take this apart. Then we'll remove that. And you can see why they have oil inside here. You need lubrication. As the camshaft rotates like this. Whoa. You see here we have our intake, which is going to create the vacuum. You probably run that to your brake booster or something. And inside of here we have an eccentric shaft and a single vein. As that rotates it's going to create negative pressure inside of here and that's what's going to create your vacuum. And you can see there's quite a few machining marks but there's also a couple of wear marks inside of here. And I could just pop that out. 
Here you can see the oil draw where it's going to bring in some oil to lubricate that pump. We've also got a little valve over here that's going to open and close and that also is vacuum regulated as well. And of course carbon buildup is not really going to be an issue because you have port injection which is going to wash off the valves before it goes into the engine. This intake however does not have any fancy flaps or anything just has a map sensor on it and that's it. Of course water pump failures were another common point on the Chevy Cruises. This one here has got a plastic impeller which I don't really like and I don't really see any weep holes. Looking inside the valve cover of course there's no tarnish this is a brand new engine. We've got these two variable valve timing solenoids that would mount up inside of here. That's something I don't really like because that means you've got oil that has to pass from one component to the other and it's just another point of failure when these rubber seals fail you start losing oil pressure. And that's a pretty much a look inside of a brand new GM Ecotec small gasoline engine and how it works. Overall I was still pretty surprised and disappointed to see that there is wear on the camshafts and the combustion chambers are pretty dirty for a brand new engine but they do say that engines do take some time to break in so I hope that's all the wear you're gonna see. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.